Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's edition of our podcast uh, as our critical conversation through Faith Learn Thrive. I pray that you have had a wonderful evening, a wonderful day, and that you are excited about tonight's conversation. Uh, we are here to share and to learn how to help make churches thrive, how to build stronger churches. So we are thankful to be in conversation this uh, evening with uh, this March uh, conversation series, this critical conversation series related to connecting for a change. Uh, first, let me introduce uh, Faith Learn Thrive. Faith Learn Thrive is our initiative at Hood Theological Seminary. It's focused on our thriving congregations initiative. Our, we seek to build stronger churches. So we want to engage with you uh, as you seek to adapt to the changes that your congregation is dealing with in these days that we're living in. So much change has happened uh, throughout the world and those changes impact the church and each of us as we seek to make disciples for Jesus Christ. So it's so important for us to gather and to have conversations and to learn from each other how that we can uh, do the work for the kingdom of God and make disciples for Christ. So. We are thankful to uh, be with you this evening uh, as part of Faith Learn Thrive. And uh, our leadership of Faith Learn Thrive is uh, Dr. Rona Williams, who is our associate director. She's in the background, and I serve as director. And uh, we have with us as our panelists uh, Dr. Joe Daniels and Christy Latona. Uh, they are authors of a book called Connecting for a Change How to Engage People churches, partners to inspire hope for your community. So I'm excited about the, our conversation tonight. Hope you are too. So as we converse this evening, uh, feel free to put comments in the chat as we uh, have this conversation and share with each other. So I want to now pause for uh, our opening prayer and then we'll get right into it. All right, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you another, for another day's journey, for another opportunity to feel your Holy Spirit, for your Holy Spirit to direct us and lead us in this conversation, this critical conversation about how we as your people can help build stronger churches, how we can help churches to thrive for your glory. Thank you for our speakers this evening, our panelists. Thank you for each and every person that is joining us this evening. May we be blessed in your Holy Spirit to do your will in all that we do. Help us to give you praise every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. All right. So as I mentioned, our panelists are Dr. Joe Daniels and Christy Latona. I'm going to uh, have them introduce themselves uh, to us in a few minutes. But let me, let me throw out this thought. Are you missing a connection with the church as you knew it pre-COVID? Well, think about this. What if God is changing church from as usual and there is no going back to where it used to be? Where do we go from here? So tonight's conversation really focuses on with Dr. Daniels and uh, with Christy, uh, on how we can connect and how we can deal with this change and, and make our connections with each other in the community, uh, how we can reimagine those so that the local church continues to thrive. So I wanna welcome uh, Dr. Joe Daniels and Christy Latona to Faith Learn Thrive in our March Critical Conversation Series. As they come on, we'll ask them to introduce themselves before we get into our conversation this evening. Hello, sir. How are you? Good evening, Joe. How you doing? I'm going fine. It's great to be with you all this evening. Great to be with you. Great to have you. Great to have you. Good evening, Christy. Hey, how are you? So good, good. to be with you. Great, great. Good to have you both. And this is an exciting topic as we think about connecting for a change and learning how, you know, that will help us to think about uh, building thriving churches uh, in the day that we live in, because this is a different time that we're living in, right? 
Absolutely. That it is. <laughs> that it is. It sure is. It sure is. So as we get started, why don't we uh, want to ask both of you to introduce yourselves from the perspective of your ministry. Uh, and uh, that way the audience gets to know a, a little bit more about you. And then we can kind of delve into uh, connecting for a change. Joe, why don't, you, why don't you go ahead and get started? Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Joe Daniels. I serve as the lead pastor at the Emory Fellowship in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have served there for 30 years, uh, 30 years in a United Methodist Church, which is an anomaly of sorts, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful marriage between pastor and people, people and pastor. And so it's it's been just a phenomenal, phenomenal journey. Uh, also, uh, for three years, served as district superintendent uh, for the Greater Washington District of the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church while pastoring Emory, which was also something different uh, in our denomination. Just a few people had done that. And so a lot of uh, uh, the book is is out of that experience of, of pastoring and, and superintending along with my dear colleague, Christy Latone. All right. Great. Yeah, so I'm actually a member of Emory, but my ministry setting is I am the uh, Chief Program Officer and Director of Connectional Ministries at the Baltimore Washington Conference of the United Methodist Church, which means I serve under our Bishop Latrell Miller Easterling, and uh, um, who is the Episcopal leader of a thousand churches in Maryland, all the United Methodist churches in D.C., Maryland, Delaware, and a little bit of West Virginia, and my task is to um, sort of steward the vision of making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world and offering our churches um, space to connect with one another, with God and, and their communities um, in order to really achieve that mission of our church. So I was happy to hear you even articulate that as you were talking about your mission, right? Like that's what we're about. And it's really can be really difficult to keep the main thing, the main thing in the midst of all of this change, but it's essential. That's right. That's right. So I, I'm excited to hear you know, your uh, background and the ministry context that you come from. And it, it basically tells me uh, you have seen a lot of change. You have probably been through a lot of change. You have helped congregations and pastors and laity through a lot of change. So I think this conversation is going to be really rich as we think about um, connecting for a change. So let's 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 get into the conversation. Sure. Um, so our focus is connecting for a change, how to engage people, churches, partners to inspire hope in your community. All right. Now, this is the title of your book. Mm -hmm. So can each of you kind of share what the Lord uh, put in your spirit for the church when you decided to write this book? Well, um, first and foremost, um, this book kind of came out of, 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 from my perspective, came out of uh, my experiences as, as pastoring Emory over the, the many years that I have, as well as superintending in the Baltimore Washington Conference. And the big thing um, that I wanted to leave with the church was the power of connection and, and, and what can happen when a church uh, literally begins to come out from its sanctuary and into the streets uh, where literally a church connects with the community around it, uh, the powerful things that can happen. My story simply is uh, I went to a church that was about to close. Uh, we were almost closed on um, three occasions, almost sold on two occasions. And so I literally went as a, a pulpit supply pastor for the first year and before I was uh, actually, my orders were recognized in the United Methodist Church. And I've experienced that church um, go from almost closing uh, to uh, 400 members uh, active worshiping uh, before the pandemic, uh, from almost closing to literally uh, building a $60 million uh, fully affordable 99 unit uh, uh, rental housing facility for the marginalized and disenfranchised in the District of Columbia. And all of that took place because we had the audacity uh, to connect with the community, to connect with uh, other churches, to connect with uh, the three sectors that make up uh, every community, the public sector, government sector, and private sector. And so I just wanted to, to just leave for the church, uh, a framework 
uh, for how this could happen uh, with anybody who, who is bold and, and courageous enough, uh, lay and clergy, uh, to, to see what God can do in community. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that as we were working um, in the district together, um, we saw the power of um, what was what was um, helping churches move forward and what where churches were getting really stuck and derailed in those 66 churches in that in that uh, district. Mm -hmm. And part of what felt to me like a real strong call from God is to say, share what you know, right? Like yeah, yeah. share what you know that, that that we have churches who who are locked up in old ways of understanding themselves and they need to be liberated so that they might liberate others. Mm -hmm. um, we have churches who think that who are who are engaged in transactional relationships, which is not the kind of relationship that Jesus modeled. We are called to be transformational uh, and understand that that we're not bringing something good that we we are. We are co-collaborators with God and with the people that we serve. And so there were just these sort of four core areas that we noticed that the churches that sort of came alive were able to make these transitions in building relationships and utilizing their assets and organizing people and in getting liberated from worrying about the minor stuff and majoring in the major stuff. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I, and, and, and it's so needed and it was needed also in our denomination as, as fighting, um, overtake, overtook unity. We're called <laughs> to be way yeah. more united than, yeah. uh, divided. Yeah. So those are some interesting thoughts you, you, you guys have shared. You know, I heard this idea of sometimes congregations are, locked up you know uh, also you know co-collaboration those seem to be powerful things to be considering from the, the perspective of leadership in the church and not just at the pastor but also at, at the lady uh can you expound on that is am i getting it right or what would you say <laughs> christy i'll let you go first on that <laughs> yeah you're on it um I, and i think i think the other experience that we bring is i'm lay i'm a, i'm not a pastor um joe is my pastor and the power of if, if we don't have all of us in it yeah. um we're missing it we're missing the mark in a major way we are all called um to ministry and, and under collaborating with one another and with God, like sometimes I think teams also leave God out of it. Um, this discernment piece is real. Um, and, and, and without all of that understanding of collaboration, you can't help but be locked up. Okay. All right. So Vincent, we, and, and to add to that, we were experiencing when we went across the, the 66 churches in our district and we began talking to clergy and laity uh, to really to really get them to communicate what they would like to see happen, not only in their local churches, but in their community and in the district as as uh, at large. Um, we, we kept hearing um, disconnection. We kept hearing division. We kept hearing uh, um, distrust and we kept hearing disbelief. Uh, and we, we, we use that really as a framework as as really the four things that kill mission and that kill mission strategy and that uh, do not allow churches to be all that churches could be. And, and so um, the whole effort of connecting for a change is how do we get rid of those four things and how do we really pull the four things of mission strategy in place? Um, building relationships, as Christy said, organizing people, utilizing assets yep. and liberating congregations. All right. Interesting you use this the, the term mission strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when when some church leaders hear hear that they, they hear mission as right. one thing <laughs> and strategy as another thing. But in, in your book, you focus on mission strategy. You, you bring the two together. Uh, I think that's powerful. Um, help our help our um, listeners to, to, to better grasp and, and put their arms around that well there's there's got to be a plan right um, there's got to be a plan and 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 
as superintendent, uh, I was the chief mission strategy for the district. Um, Christy's background is, is as a mission strategist in a number of different roles that she's played over, over her career. And, and so you've got to have a plan in order to do the two things that Jesus really focused on. And, and Jesus, in, in his lifetime, as we, as we know, he focused on meeting people's tangible needs and he uh -huh. focused on offering people salvation as he did that. And so mission strategy simply is a plan for, for fulfilling that. Uh, and as we define it, it, it is a plan for, for building relationships because you've got to have relationships if you're going to have any impact on people's lives. You've got to be able to organize people uh, around uh, causes and needs and fulfilling those needs. You, you, we've got tons of assets that oftentimes we don't even know we have. They're underutilized or we, we don't know. Uh, and then a lot of people just need to be set free, liberated to, to operate in their giftedness and, and to let that, that spiritual giftedness thrive. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, and I would add to that to say, in the church, sometimes um, the, the people that we've worked with, sometimes they think about mission as outreach, as opposed to mm -hmm. mission being to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation okay. of the world. So like there's sometimes that kind of miss on mission. And the other piece is that if we take, if, if we separate them, what we get is I behave one way <laughs> when I'm in the church. Yeah. yeah. And I behave another way when I'm out of the church and the plans that I make for my church are about my church and not about the community. Oh. So like lots of times when we work, you know, when we've gone in to look at churches, strategic plans are like, we want to grow the number of worship attendants. We want by 10%. We want to do that. Like these are the kind of goals, but there's not a sort of mission focused strategy that okay. includes the community. It can be really inward focused. Yeah. yeah. And Jesus was never inward focused. Right. Right. So how how will a, a, this small congregation or medium sized congregation that that may want to take that step of faith as you're highlighting to to go out in the community? Um, they've never done that before, or maybe the congregation hasn't done that before, and and, and they don't know how to how to how to begin that. What would you say to them? We would say, don't be afraid. <laughs> uh, fear not. Um, fear not. Okay. That's fear a good not one. is the first thing. That's scriptural. And yeah, yeah, it is. And it all is. I mean, that's the that's sort of the point, right? That that in in doing this, we actually deepen our own discipleship and our own connection with God and Jesus. And and I think and part of what um, we have to unlearn is that when we say to go out in the community. It isn't to knock on doors to get people to come into the church. Okay. Like, okay. Okay. you know, I, like even just a conversation I was having the other day, someone said, you know, we're all over, we're 70 and 80 years old. We're, we, we will not knock on doors of our neighbors. And I'm like, we're not asking you to knock on doors of your neighbors. We're asking you that when you run into people in your community and actually physically put yourself in the community, that you actually start up a conversation where the focus is on the well-being and the other, that what makes the other tick, that what makes the other, um, you know, uh, dream, what, what are they dreaming of? What are they hoping for? Just getting to build relationships. And I, you know, and <laughs> Joe, I still remember that one, we were modeling one-on-one -on -one relationship, relational meetings, and it took a lot, lot of time for people to understand that it, this, it's a starting point for actually building an authentic relationship and not a mechanism for recruiting people into the church. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's really amazing how uh, people really struggle with a one-on-one -on -one relationship, um, particularly with people we don't know. Yeah. yeah. And so a lot of what we did and a lot of what we do um, is really teaching people how to conduct a one-on-one -on -one relational meeting where you are just seeking to get to know someone, uh, to, to figure out where one's passion is. What do they love to do? What is their vision uh, for their life, for their church, for their community, for their family? Uh, what is their desire 
what they, what, what they really, really, if they could really do anything they wanted to do, what would it be in life? Uh, and, and helping people develop the skills to do these one-on-ones so they can really get at the core of what people's self-interest are and, and what real, really where people need to be positioned um, with their times and ener- time and energy to do ministry. Okay. Yeah, and I think it's like that for, for me, like part of it is understand that 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 this is, um, while it may be scary for some and we're not used to doing it, um, you will meet you will meet Jesus in doing it. It is transformational two ways. And, and this yeah. building up of empathy for people out in the community, is essential if we're going to do anything um, differently. If it's and, just about what we go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, and it's what Jesus did ninety nine point nine percent of his time. Yeah, he, he was he was in the community. I mean, he he went to church every Sunday, as was his custom. Luke tells us that, and so so we ought to be worshiping consistently every 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 week in some form or fashion, whether it be Thursday, Sunday, whenever we gather for worship. But the the, the majority of Jesus time was out meeting people. He was he was meeting people with issues. He was meeting prostitutes. He was eating dinner at at people's tables. He was on fishing boats with different. I mean, he was he was engaged in community, running into people he didn't know, introducing himself, finding out where they were, what was going on, meeting a tangible need, and then letting people know, you know what? Um, I am the one who can can offer you the life you always dreamed of. And we need to get back to those basic things that Jesus did, particularly now post-pandemic. Uh, we really need to do those things. Yeah. yeah. And you don't have to be a big church to do it. It just takes exactly. two people. I mean, it really, truly, if you have a church size of two, that go out and start talking to people exactly. authentically, without judgment, without an agenda, without strings attached, unconditionally love, you know, embodying unconditional love, good things will happen. Yeah, yeah. And I, I hear you emphasizing something I think we, we talk about in the church a lot, and that is you need that relationship with that person before you can even think about getting them into the church. Exactly, exactly, and 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 things happen when that happens. I, I like to I like to tell the story of uh, a gentleman who uh, worshipped with us for a while. His his name was Jim, and we called him Big Jim. Okay. And Big Big Jim uh, was homeless for six months of the year, and then he'd go home for six months and live with his mom. And Big Jim was was struggling with, you know, emotional emotional needs like many people do on, uh, uh, in, in life. And, and, uh, but Big Jim felt the love of people uh, in our congregation. And Big Jim was there for us in the local church and community. Okay, we built that relationship with him. And I'll never forget, he came, he came to the church one day and I was rushing out and I said, Jim, I can't talk to you now, but I will. He said, I just want to tell you something, Pastor. I said, what's that? He said, um, he said, I know when you come in and I know when you leave. And I want you to know that we have your back. And and, and so this I, we play, right? We had yeah. developed a one-on-one relationship with Jim. Through that one-on-one relationship, we started feeding people. We started bringing people into the church for, for, uh, for just to be warm at times. And what took place as he articulated was because you began a relationship with me i've told others you've now begun other relationships with others and we the community have you we're watching out for you yeah and and this is the kind of connection that we're talking about that can bring about transformation in a community okay great great it was it was the seeds of that that led to us even being able to build a 60 million dollar project for people to have an affordable place to live. And and that project and the work that you guys do at Emory, you aren't a huge church, as I understand. <laughs> we were 400 members in worship 
pre-pandemic. Pre-pandemic. Okay? Mm -hmm. And yes, 400 people built a $60 million project. And But that's the, you would think that a mega church would do that kind of thing. But the reality of it is, as Christy said, it does not, it, it's not about the numbers per se. It is about connecting with people who have a God-sized vision and who are willing to take God-sized risks in order to accomplish God-sized dreams and visions. And if we do these things and connect with those across sectors, anything can happen. Yeah. Lives will be changed holistically. Yep. And that's that's what Christian service is about, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And so, and, and, and to this point, and Christy, you can speak to this because because you're really do, dealing a lot of, about this in, in the role that you play now. Um, you know, post pandemic, a lot of people are afraid of, of you know, what's gonna happen to the church? We're, we're, you know, there's a whole lot of conversations about churches closing or the threat of churches closing. What do we do? There, there are pastors that are retiring and people who are lay people who are like, eh, I don't know because all of a sudden now church looks completely different than what it did. But really, if we really look at it, God is drawing us back to the basics. Jesus is drawing us back to the basic um, uh, uh, responsibilities, obligations of making disciples for Christ and, and making disciples who focus on the holistic needs of people physical emotional mental spiritual relational and financial and if we engage with people in that regard we're doing church it may look different than what we're used to but we're doing church yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i and and i would i would i would agree uh wholeheartedly obviously with that and i think that the that i think we have to unhook ourselves from some of that scarcity mentality that I think COVID has magnified for some people. Mm -hmm. And so this, you know, we serve an abundant God. We yeah. serve a, a, a God that, that, that outpours extravagantly all that we need for what it is that we're being called to do. And I think that that change of, of, of mindset is, is all is significant for the church right now. When we when we're seeing different kinds of numbers in the things that we normally count, you know, budgets and people and, and that kind of thing. But we have to understand that, like when we <laughs> if when we shift to abundance and seeing what we can do and, and, and through in and through God working in and through us. Right. And us connecting with each other and with people in the community, there's not a scarcity and at all. But if we operate that way, we're not going to be able to make those shifts and we're not going to be able to really even see the, the resources that are plentiful in front of us, even if they're in in other spaces outside of the church. So as the church shrinks itself in on itself with the scarcity thinking or with the we, we, we you know, it, inward mindset, um, our ability to do what it is that we're called to do likewise shrinks yeah I, i'd like that that you reminded us of the importance of not having this scarcity mentality because sometimes that might seem to overwhelm you know if you think in terms of well we're a small church so we can't do a whole lot we we we, we don't have the number of people as that church or we don't have this or we don't have that but you're saying it's it's really not about that. It's more about it's the mentality. It's the mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how have have you helped change some church uh, churches <laughs> that may have had that? Uh, any good examples that you might uh, share with us that might pique an interest from you know one of our listeners that says, "Oh yeah, that relates to us. We can think about that that way too." Uh, <laughs> it's like how much time you have, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I I would offer the example um 
you know, when we were working together on the district, Christy and I, um, uh, our the vision that we established out of the one on ones we started doing around our district was claim your zip code for Jesus Christ. Okay. And so we organized churches within zip codes. Uh, and um, we we asked people, we asked churches to do two things to, to work together to meet tangible needs and to offer people Christ. Uh, and when we came together for our annual meetings within our denomination with our churches, uh, we had people tell stories. Uh, and and so uh, within those stories, we had churches in some of the poorest neighborhoods in D.C. Um, get together and start feeding people. Uh, we had uh, uh, one ministry literally that had a food table that must have extended a, uh, a couple blocks where they fed the neighborhood uh, through connections and partnerships that they had, had built uh, with uh, food agencies in the city. And they literally felt, they literally fed people uh, who were having a tough time finding healthy food to eat. Uh, we, we, had, we had other uh, clusters come together and deal with issues of uh, prostitution uh, uh, we were out 5 a.m. with church leaders, lay and clergy, trying to figure out how might um, neighborhoods change that were being impacted by um, uh, human trafficking and sex trafficking. And uh, one of the churches had opened itself up at 4.30, 5.30 in the morning to offer showers to people and meals to people. And, 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 and churches connected in this kind of way. This is what happens again when, when you when people start building relationships across racial lines, across class lines, across lines of difference of any sort. Suddenly we start getting to to the main thing and we start experiencing lives change. OK. And I think simply also to, to shift from what we don't have mentality to what we do have mm -hmm. mentality which is another way of saying scarcity to abundance yep. is to have people map out their assets and understand that their assets aren't just money. So yep. like, what are their human, what human capital do you have? What skill sets are in your congregation? What, what, who, who are you connected to who wants to, you know, even if they're not um, a member, yep. you know, who, what kinds of um, assets, in terms of human capital do you have? What facility assets do you have? What relational assets do you have? Like that, that are in your community? What, what, what reputation do you have? What, um, you know, equipment do you have laying around? One of, the, one of the tools that we use is something called Mission Possible, where people come up with the craziest ministry ideas given the assets of 10 mason jars and a circus tent. And they can, they can weirdly, these churches who come in with an abundant, with a scarcity mentality can innovate ministry and connection with, with the community to solve a community problem like hunger or mental health or whatever, using mason jars and a circus tent. And then when they go to their own place, they say, we don't have anything to do anything with, right? Yeah, so it's yeah. also giving people experiences of abundance thinking, um, as, as, as well as like that, that sort of tangible and intangible assets that we all have. And, and, and just adding to that, I, I, the abundance is within the community where we live, move and have our being. Every community is made up of three sectors, any community, whether it be rural, whether it be ex-urban, suburban, urban, whatever. Every community has a public sector, a government sector, and a private sector. The private sector brings the money into the neighborhood, provides the jobs. The government sector legislates and provides services to people who, who need it. And the public sector is, is you and I, Jane and John Q. Public. And so regardless of a church's size, there are people within every congregation who operate in those sectors, who know people in those sectors, who have relationships with people in those sectors, who have, who have connections to assets in those sectors. 
And so when we when we maximize the asset by identifying where it might be, who knows who, who has what, um, you know, <laughs> what's going on at the feeding store down the street, um, who has supplies that we may not know about. Yeah. All of a sudden, we're able to pull together what we have and do things that we never thought we could do on our own simply because we reached out to other people and realized that there is abundance in relationship. There's scarcity when we stay close to ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Well, as I reflect on the book, um, you know, the book speaks to the idea of aligning the what the who the how and the when <laughs> with god's why right where does this idea of what god's call on ministry for a congregation fit into this paradigm mm. <laughs> I, I, personally i think every every congregation wherever it is wherever it may be located um from a building point of view, but also from a people point of view, um, there is a context, mm -hmm. right? Um, why did God start the church where you are? Why didn't God start the church down the street from where you are or across town? And so every, every congregation has within it uh, an historical context, a political context, a community context, a religious context, mm -hmm. um, that if we take time to discover what that context is, all of a sudden we begin to sense uh, the who, where, why, what, uh, the call of God on a particular congregation in a particular season or seasons. Mm -hmm. I'll take my our our congregation just very quickly. We 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 did this major project, but in the project we were challenged uh, by historical preservation uh, groups who didn't want us to build next to a federal fort, even though we were building on our own land. Well, just make a long story short. In in this uh, uh, instance, we discovered from a historical context point of view that, that our history did not begin with the Civil War because we sit next to Fort Stevens, which is the only fort that a sitting president visited during wartime, Abraham Lincoln. But we were actually sitting on land that was owned by a free black woman all the way back to 1800. Hmm. So here is our church which some were saying was, was, oh, well, you're connected to the Civil War. Yes, we were, but our origins actually began with a free black woman during slavery time who was housing people affordably because she used her land to house runaway slaves and free blacks. And here we were 260 years later seeking to house people affordably yeah. who were being displaced because they had nowhere else to go. That historical context inspired us to realize that God has calls on congregations for particular seasons and particular times. And when we do that contextual work, we're able to discover that. Yeah, and, 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 and that call, like where God is calling you, a tool that we use in working with congregations is sort of a, a like putting together three circles and what is the overlap? Mm -hmm. That's the, also part of the why, right? So it's the intersection of the community's voice. What is a community crying out for? What is it hope for? Where are the pain points? And how does that, and, 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 and how is a congregation uniquely gifted and uniquely excited about that meets that pain point. And then how does that intersect again to, to, to the God's why, God's call, um, the leader's collective purpose, lay and clergy together, what really energizes them and innovates them. I think sometimes ch churches get locked up in trying to mimic or emulate the church down the street or do better than the church mm -hmm. down the street. Competition is gonna kill the church. This yeah. is, we are not in competition with one another. We are all supposed to be figuring out where's God calling us? How has God positioned us? 
historically, but also currently, where are those gifts and talents and how can we best utilize them to meet the needs of the community? And, and, and I think the churches that find how they're uniquely positioned to, to meet those needs um, or those visions or that, that, that pain point in the community, um, discover partners that want to help them do that if they're not imposing their own desires on the community. So, so often our churches, right? Yeah, they'll yeah. just say, this is what the community needs. This is what we're gonna give you. Come come to our church. <laughs> yeah. we, we had a situation in our district when we, were, when we were working together where we had two churches, one in, in uh, War Three, which is on the Northwest side of town, all the way on the Northwest side of town, and another in Ward Eight on the Southeast side of town one black, one white. And these two churches suddenly recognized that they had a common passion around housing and around food and that they had assets that could help each other on different parts of the city in different class uh, structured neighborhoods of the city, but they had, they had a commonality. And we ended up making them a cluster because they shared a common vision of, of, of seeking um, to fulfill God's call on their life to bridge a divided city and meet needs uh, that otherwise would not have been met. Yeah. yeah. And so, so these are the things that can happen um, when we dare to discern what God's call might be, even if it looks completely different from what we thought and we're willing to build the relationships and the connections to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like how you both have said that and, and made the reference to thinking historically, but currently. Yes. So I think that's so important because if you think historically and you put currently with it, that still intersects this idea of change. Yeah, exactly. And, and that means we always need to be, I mean, current means current, current. <laughs> that means tomorrow's current is not the same as today's current. Right. So we as the church always need to be current in thinking about how to serve God's people. Amen. And it's not what we did a hundred years ago. It might not even be what we did. I mean, definitely not what we did 2019, right? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. And, and, and yeah, absolutely. And I think that, that, that part of the habit that we have to break is that, um, that we're building program and then building another program and keeping everything the same and keeping all the plates spinning. Yeah. Because especially as the world is changing, continues to change rapidly and tomorrow is not the same as today. So mm -hmm. current is, you know, as you say, is constantly moving. The, 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 the ability of a congregation to get that skill set of let's try this and see if this helps move us closer to God's call and be so call focused that the way in which we do it, we can let go of and make a new experiment or let go of that ministry for a season to see if that if anybody even misses it. Because yeah. a lot of times that also is what is what suffocates churches is just what's on their calendar and trying to keep all of these balls in the air or plates spinning or ministry programs going. But, and that can drift us away from our vision and mission, our call and building relationships. So some churches in order to do this kind of work that we're talking about, it, they might have to pause some things for a season, yeah. especially in, 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 in churches that, that are doing too much. And yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a difference between activity and impact. And yeah. I think yeah. what, we're yeah. what change requires is impact. Yeah, absolutely. This is the second day I've heard this term, second day in a row. Mm. Mission drift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's I was dangerous. talking to somebody yesterday and they mentioned the same thing. It is so dangerous. Do you know, it, because we don't even realize that we're drifting. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Right? That's what makes it a drift and not a, <laughs> you know, it, if, you, if you follow the trajectory of an arrow and it's off by one millimeter, 
eventually it is totally off course. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Right. Which is yep. why, which is why there has to be a strategy. Okay. okay. And which is why there has to be a periodic evaluation of the strategy. Yep. As to whether or not it is working. That's you know, right. And What's the, okay. What are the fruits of our labor? And being okay with failure, understanding that that's all learning. Good point. Good like to, to like sometimes we are so afraid of of doing something wrong that by the time we <coughs> so certain that this is going to work, the context has changed, reality has changed. Yep. And so it, it's it's it, that back to your 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 you're on it in terms of this learning piece, right? That 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 a learning con learning congregations will continue to iterate and create what it is that is needed to meet God's call. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me shift gears just a little bit. So as we've talked uh, about uh, the book, um, the book was actually written in 2019, or it came out in 2019. Yes. And here we are at 2023. I'm curious as to what you've learned in the gap, because in that gap has been COVID. So, so <laughs> what I've what I've learned is is that um, the things that we wrote about, um, not only were they accurate then four years ago, but yeah. they're really accurate now. Not only are they were they needed four years ago, but they are really needed really now. needed now. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, we we the book was published from our denominational point of view. The the book was published right at the moment where our denomination was facing a major split, and and we've been we've been marching through that split even as we speak right now. Talk yeah. talking about you know present and, and and all the like and and the the learnings for me personally were it's time to take these principles that that you've been working on that you've been teaching others about it's time for you to even take them deeper now wow. uh, because they are needed that much more to build new connections in a new season with a new church Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, yeah, absolutely, and 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 I would echo everything that you just said, and I would say that the if we were writing the book today, we would probably have additional examples around the pain of loss of relationship. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. in some of the churches that we're working with currently in our Catalyst Initiative, we were talking about building relationships in the community and this leader, just this lay person just started sobbing. And it was because of the loss of relationship with so many in their own congregation mm -hmm. that they weren't even feeling connected to the own people in their congregation. Yep. Um, and so there's a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot more pain today in all of these areas. Um, they, they, so like that going deeper, yeah, part of it is also probably having to heal from some of the loss mm -hmm. um, in order to move forward and some of the grief. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's helping people, it's helping people to embrace skills that um, are needed for us to go forward now that pre-COVID helped us get away with post COVID no longer allows us to get away with. So I was, I was having some conversations today with pastors and laity uh, around the fact that many pastors are retiring or just getting out of it because their understanding of ministry was in that, in those four walls. And now with everything changed, I mean, I was telling somebody today, uh, you know, Pete, we got one chance on Sunday morning. If, if if a young adult walks in and the sermon is not good, yep. they're like, I don't need to waste my time coming here. I can tap on my phone and dial up any preacher I want to <laughs> listen to, and I can get a word in 20, 25 minutes, and I've saved time, right? 
yep. and I can go do something else. And, and so, so ministers and laity have to learn a new way. And, and perhaps again, as I said earlier, the old way of, of doing church. And, and as we've, as we've talked about building relationships, organizing people, utilizing assets, liberating people um and 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 building new opportunities for for fellowship to take place for uh church to take place in different spaces home uh this was starting before uh covid the coffee shop yep yep the golf the golf course I was a part of a golf course fellowship that had a revival for three days. It was incredible. And we were not, we were, we weren't in church. We were on a golf course. And yet there was teaching and Bible study, fellowship, meeting people's needs. And so church can happen. You know, we have a slogan in our denomination, church can happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need to figure out, you know, Paul was a tent maker for a reason. Jesus was a carpenter for a reason. For a reason. Yeah. They were bivocational. We're going to need to figure out ways that, you know, clergy people are going to need to figure out ways where we can serve, but where we need to make a living in different ways. It's, 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 it's a new day, but yet it's an old day. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I would say, and I would say that, that, that this grief, lots of times the new energy comes from doing it differently. Like yep. that, 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 like, and, and, and there, you know, at some points we talk <laughs> and I've talked about like the, the being able part of the strategy that's mission based strategy is also about how are we building momentum for change? Um, okay. and, and I, I remember a church that was, I think actively during COVID 15 people showing up on a zoom, finding renewed energy just by doing Bible study in the park and having someone come up and join them and pray and end up doing the closing prayer. And all of a sudden they were no longer concerned about whether or not um, they were going to get this person to come into their church because they were experiencing church now. Yeah, right there. So I, think, right. I think part of it is like, what is the shortest distance <laughs> a church can create? What's the smallest thing that they can do to experience church differently? Because I think a lot of times we get stuck in these ruts of how do we make what we're doing better yeah. when we find yeah. new life, trying something new and getting new spirit, new energy, new new understanding even of what's possible. Because as adults, we really do need to experience it or need to have a need to do it in order to actually change. Yeah, yeah. So you, you touched on something I, I we don't we don't have a whole lot of time left, but I, I I think I'll just throw this out just as a, a point of reference and to get your thoughts. A key com key component for relationships in the church of today and tomorrow is engaging with the younger generation. Can you say something about that relative to the connection comp component? Yeah, it's all about it's all about being relevant and being and being like not at all um, pretentious. So there was a, an event that we were just at yesterday where a young man who was working the sound booth, who does not go to a church said, if the church was speaking this kind of truth and this kind of, um, real language, I would, I would be a member of a church. I would be a member of this kind of church. So that we need that freshness and to understand that, that young people, they, they have a really great meter for knowing whether or not we're walking our talk and whether or not our talk matters to them and whether or not they can have a voice and a role to play in the church. They know immediately. And, and many of them simply want opportunities to serve. Uh, they want to serve in community. They want to serve in the church. And if the, if the door is open and, and the opportunities are presented for that to happen, yeah, I want to be a part of that. Okay. Yeah. If if y'all going if y'all be out if y'all going to be out here feeding people, I want to be a part of that. I want to I want to be able to do something tangible that that causes what happens in the sanctuary to make sense because you are coming out to the street. 
Uh, and and as Christy said, the the BS barometer is up, and and they can discern what is BS and what is real. Yep. And they want something that is relevant, something that is authentic, something that shows the love of Christ for one another. And if we provide that, they will come. Well, and as you know, like nowadays, there isn't the assumption that they're going to be looking for church. So the only way we're going to meet young people is if we're out in the streets behaving as Jesus. Exactly. My, 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 I'll tell this story real quick. My son uh, joined a church in Arkansas. Um, and I asked him, I said, son, why'd you join that church? He said, oh, it was very easy. I said, what's that? He said, I went to a community meeting and the pastor of the church where I visited, he was there and I went to visit his church and I liked the worship and all, but I wanted to know what was going on in the community. I went to a different community meeting and the pastor was at that meeting. And then I went back to the church and then I went to a different community meeting and the pastor was at that church. And I was like, he said, I was like, Lord, if the pastor is out here in the community, yeah, I need to be a part of that church be. because there's that connection. The connection with him. Great example. Great example. So we have got four minutes. I want to say for the next minute, what last thing would both of you like to leave with our audience? Maybe an action step or some piece of wisdom you would like for our audience to take with them from this conversation. I know they've taken a lot of notes and you guys have given a lot of nuggets, but I want to just give you an opportunity to, to leave one last thing. Ladies before gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I like an action step. I would say because relationship building is so key, go ahead and make a list of 50 people that you know, that you encounter in the neighborhood, 10 people from the neighborhood, 10 people from businesses that you frequent, 10 people who serve you in some kind of way, and, and go ahead and, and 10 people who um, who you've never, who you see around, uh, whether you're at, at school or with your kids or whether you're with your grandchildren, and really make a conscious effort to, to, to talk with them and to get to know a little bit about them versus just being in a transactional kind of, you know, we see each other, we're neighbors, but we don't really talk. Yeah. That would be the challenge is just wherever you are, start making your list of 50. All right. Great. Thank and you. I, and I would just simply add to that, that 10 of those be with at least 10 of those be with people who don't look like you, talk like you, act like you frequent where you frequent, but they are different from you because in building a relationship with someone different from you, you will expand your sphere of influence to bring about change in a community that is sorely needed, particularly in this day and time where we are divided by race and ethnicity in tremendous ways. And we're, we are divided over sex and other issues around that. All right. Great. Great. Thank you both so much for sharing with us this evening. This has been a rich and great conversation. I really appreciate it. And I know our audience appreciates it. So I just want to say thank you again to uh, both of you, Christy and, and Joe, for taking time to, to uh, be on this Faith, Learn, Thrive journey with us uh, as we continue to do the work of the Lord. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Doing the great work that you're doing. Praise yeah. God. Praise God. Fabulous work. Keep it up. Praise the Lord. So again, thanks to everyone uh, on the, the event. Thank you again for everyone attending. Again, if you would like to connect with us at Faith Learn Thrive, go to faithlearnthrive.org. And at our website, you can uh, see not only these recordings, this particular one will be there. You can see the previous ones. You can learn about the uh, learning community that we have, as well as our ministry labs, as well as uh, our experience with coaching and our upcoming events. We do have a conference coming up in June, June 9th and 10th. It will be in Salisbury, North Carolina. We are looking forward to seeing so many in the community and having a great time in fellowship and worship and music and food and fellowship and connecting with the total community. So, we look forward to seeing each of you 
Uh, again, faithlearnthrive.org. Uh, connect with us on Facebook or Instagram at uh, Faith Learn Thrive, at Faith Learn Thrive on both of those, at Faith Learn Thrive underscore hood for Twitter, and Faith Learn Thrive for LinkedIn. I hope everyone has a great evening. Take care. May God bless you all. Thank you. Good evening.